Hola a todos, espero que estén muy bien. Eh, hoy tenemos con nosotros a George Serafin. Eh, George es profesor de administración de empresas en Harvard Business School y es además el, el faculty chair del proyecto de Impact Weighted Accounts. Eh, él ha enseñado en múltiples eh, ocasiones en programas de MBA, de Executive Education, incluso el programa de doctorado de Harvard Business School. Y en este momento eh, enseña un curso electivo en el MBA que se llama Reimagining Capitalism, Business and Big Problems. Eh, él ha presentado sus estudios, su teoría en más de 60 países en el mundo y ha sido expositor en eventos muy importantes con líderes de gobierno, líderes empresariales, incluido, por ejemplo, el World Economic Forum en Davos y en el Aspen Ideas Festival. Él está rankeado entre los 10 autores más populares en temas de negocios, eh, entre alrededor de 12.000 autores, eh, según el Social Science Research Network. Eh, George, uh, welcome, and uh, it's uh, great to have you here. Alvaro, thank you very much uh, for having me. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be to be with you. I also speak a little bit of Spanish, but I think I'm a little bit embarrassed to use them, given my knowledge. Great, great. That will help eventually. Um, George, um, let me start uh, by um, telling you that in general terms, I would say that in Peru, most large and to a lesser extent, Uh, medium-sized companies are in the process of assessing sustainability as a key element of their business strategy. And for all of them, it would be very helpful to shed some light on the value of precisely integrating sustainability to business strategy. And I'd like to ask you a few questions about this issue. First, um, many Latin American countries, and in particular Peru, have been going through political and economic instability. On the one hand, the pandemic has had severe impacts on both the economy and especially on health and well-being of, of its citizens. Secondly, corruption and institutional crisis led Peru to have four presidents in the past five years and we continue to undergo uh, political turmoil. That being said, George, how can the strategic approach to sustainability help companies to become more resilient and competitive in complex environments such as the one we're in? Absolutely, Alvaro, it's a, such a central question, I think, to what is the role of the corporation society in the 21st century? I think it starts by recognizing that healthy business can exist only within a healthy society. And in order for business to prosper, it has to be that society needs to prosper in the long term. So there is very much of a symbiotic relationship. And unfortunately, um, sometimes this relationship has broken down. And we have seen, for example, business success diverging from societal progress. So for me, the question is, how do we marry the two? How can we actually have a business approach that creates measurable and intentional societal value. And those two key attributes, measurable and intentional, are really key when we are thinking about the interconnection between business and society. So you started by asking this integration of all the sustainability and environmental, social and governance issues in business strategy. And I would say that in business, there has been a journey in the last a uh, decade or two decades. What we have found in research as well is that most of those sustainability issues for many companies were viewed through just a compliance and just purely risk management lens. Over time, companies were actually realizing that not, not only that, not only actually they help you from a risk management perspective, but also they help you become more operationally efficient by, for example, decreasing the use of natural resources, um, using actually uh, labor practices that are more productive and better for the employees and so forth. 
And I think the third wave that we're experiencing now is what I call innovation and growth. When we see sustainability as an engine for new products, new markets, and meeting unmet demands, either on the environmental space, actually solving some big challenges that we're having, such as, for example, climate change, biodiversity loss and damage, and how do we create new products that have new attributes across whole set of industries. Of course, all of us are know very, very well what's happening with the electrification uh, on the transportation sector. But the same thing is happening in food and agriculture, and of course, in an industry that you know very, very well in financial services, where we actually create sustainable finance products, for example, right? And I think the same thing is happening also from a societal perspective when we try to understand, for example, how can we actually create more products to empower female entrepreneurship, for example? How can we create products to, to bring access to electricity, education, healthcare to underserved populations? I think this is where um, the big opportunity lies right now to see sustainability through the lens of innovation and growth and integrate it truly in the strategy of the organization instead of looking at it at the periphery of the organization. And Alvaro, you mentioned also one key word, which is resilience. And I just want to highlight that. Um, resilience is such an important concept because it basically outlines what happens when you have a negative event, much like what we have been experiencing now, for example, with COVID. And the ability of an organization but more broadly, I would say, a society to bounce back and be resilient against those negative events. So I just want to mention uh, one study that we did at the worst part of the COVID crisis and what we found. For example, we looked at the part of uh, when capital markets were collapsing back in uh, March of 2020. Um, we had just in one month, uh, an enormous decline in most major indices of about 30% in just one month. Of course, that affects lots of people around the world. It actually affects most of the people around the world that actually their money is invested through their pensions, for example. So the question is, how could you protect against that? One of the things that we found was that organizations that moved quickly to actually protect their suppliers, their employees, and their customer relationships and produce on-demand products to meet the demands of their customers experience less negative stock returns during that month. For me, this is great evidence of resilience and of this idea that actually business success depends on multiple sources of capital, not only on financial capital, but also on social capital on the trust that exists between business and society, on human capital, all the people that bring their talent, their knowledge and their time in organizations, on intellectual capital, and of course, of the natural capital, the whole environment that we have around us and all the resources that we're using. Interesting, interesting. Um, you mentioned something that it's uh, quite, um, um, relevant nowadays and um, as, as, as we begin to integrate sustainability into business strategy we find uh, trade-offs for instance uh, companies might have to give up certain sources of revenue or they can become less competitive at least in the short term um, in certain businesses or, or um, market segments right so and, and you mentioned innovation. What, what would you say is the role of innovation in, in overcoming these potential trade-offs as we become more sustainability oriented? How, how do we start thinking outside of the box to achieve both profitable and impactful solutions to societal problems? Uh, perhaps you can, perhaps you can uh, share with us some, some examples uh, that you've seen. Absolutely, Alvaro. And let me start by saying that if something is not profitable, then from a business perspective, it's also not sustainable, right? So actually breaking some of those trade-offs and using the force of innovation to get to a better place, 
a better equilibrium, both from a societal, but from a business perspective as well, is critical in order to be competitive and in order for the companies that do the most good for the world to be also the companies that will be able to be the most competitive, right? So actually looking at it from the perspective of profitability as, as well, it's really, really important. I think something that has happened and is happening more and more is that uh, the status quo, what we are all doing right now, actually in many ways has suboptimal practices or hidden costs, costs that have never been measured. And as a result, a more holistic measurement of all cost and benefits leads to a very, very different decision. And this is also happening um, on the benefit side from the new practice that we want to adopt. I'll just give you a very simple example. In the area of climate change, for example, for a long time we have been saying all the investments that we need to make, all those expenses and so forth are just too expensive. Well, relative to what? relative to the status quo. But actually, if you are thinking about, for example, the health damages that we're having from respiratory diseases, from what we're doing right now, it actually changes completely the calculation because it incorporates a much more holistic integration of cost and benefits about the different actions and the different decisions that one needs to take. And I would say that the role of innovation is central, right? The role of innovation is central because for example, if we're just looking at something like access to health, for example, and access to healthcare, right? Um, for example, the digitization of many of those services and how can you can actually reach with mobile phones and with apps um, and the whole digitization um, wave, I would say, how we can reach cost effectively, traditionally underserved population is, I would say, unimaginable even just 10 years ago. And that has brought tremendously down the cost and has made something that was very, I would say, negative net present value, just purely from a financial perspective, something that is very, 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 very attractive, right? So I, I think the role of innovation is central, but for me, innovation is not just a technical issue, Alvaro. I think it's a cultural issue. So the question is inside the organization, is there a culture of innovation? Is there a culture where actually people can take uh, calculated manageable risks? People feel actually that if they fail in, the, um, in chasing innovation and the new practices, that is okay. That is actually part of the job. Is it a culture where actually leaders inspire people to do something different and bring a new product into the market? So I think when we're discussing also about innovation and especially about social innovation, for me, there are two key ingredients, which is holistic measurement of the cost and benefit of different practices in order to lead us to a better equilibrium. And the second one is also a cultural issue and creating and empowering people to unleash those competitive forces of innovation. Great. Uh, you, you, you make me think about what we're doing today um, in, in Credit Corp and different companies in Credit Corp. And, and we're, we're, uh, we know that we have to make sustainability embedded into our core business, right? It's not just anymore um, just um, welfare or social um, programs and so on and so forth. It has to be embedded into our products and our services, our decisions. But we have uh, like two, two ways to do that. One is to think about the products that we have today, the services that we provide, and start asking different questions, not the typical questions uh, on, on profitability and market share and so on and so forth, but, but to ask whether that is having an impact, a positive impact. What we already do, we have, we make an impact. Uh, if we stop doing something, what would be the impact of that into a community uh, or a group of customers or, or providers or, or suppliers. So that's one thing. And the other thing, the other way to, to face this is um, what else can we do? What other products can we create or services uh, that would have a positive impact into, in, in society still 
uh, being profitable. And so there are two ways well, in my learning so far is that there are two ways to face this and to put this into our core business. So it's not only innovation in what we uh, have to start doing different things that we have to start doing, but also how to think differently within um, what we already do uh, in our business lines. What do you think about this? It's such a great point, Alvaro. I, I very, very much agree with that. And I would say um, in, different, in different organizations, in different businesses, uh, one or the other can be more challenging. What I have found is that in some organizations, especially that have very, very successful products, it's harder to change the existing product, right? Absolutely. In other organizations, actually, it's harder to move away from your existing products and create new products. And that's why what you see is that many companies are actually spinning out some of those new innovative uh, platforms, right? And we see, we see a lot of that happening Again, for example, in food and agriculture with, for example, non-dairy milk or new agricultural practices, we see the same thing happening with actually um, autonomous mobility uh, sector companies, for example, or in, even in, uh, in the sector that Credit Corp is in, right, with the rise of fintech, for example, and what you can do from that perspective in terms of access to finance and providing solutions for the customers. So I think those two approach, approaches, as you say, they have to, uh, they can bring tremendous impact actually on society. In most companies, they have to be pursued in a parallel way. And from a management perspective, they have different challenges, each one of them. Definitely. And, and the change that we have to do across the companies uh, in, in how to start thinking differently and, and the traditional decisions have to be um, filtered or contrasted with, with new parameters, right? Um, now, uh, let me ask you about metrics. Uh, boards like metrics in order to assess impact, provide support to management and commit to strategic initiatives, right? Metrics on sustainability are definitely a challenge for companies. I always get questions about how do we measure this whole thing. So, and, and being able to measure the impact of companies on society is key not only for, for the companies themselves, but also for their main stakeholders. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, listed companies like ourselves are always um, facing the question and how we are measuring the whole, how, how we are making progress on societal impact. So what metrics or good practices associated with metrics could companies apply to improve uh, financial metrics and incorporate all potential sources of impact? It's such a great question. And uh, as you know, this is something that I have been working a lot because I feel that it's, it's such an important topic because fundamentally, in the absence of robust measurement, you don't have accountability. You lack the ability to set targets um, and motivate people about where we need to go. So look at, for example, the motivational effort that the Sustainable Development Goals have brought as we're moving the world to actually and try and meet them, collaborative as a global community. Um, so they have an incentive role, they have an accountability role, and they also have actually a role which is, um, it allows all of us to understand whether we are making progress over time. Much like, you know, for any one of us that um, every holidays we might be eating a little bit more, and then we go to the Weight Watcher and we weight ourselves, right? Those measurements are very, very useful to really understand how we all behave. Um, so. It's a, it's a very, very important concept. So what are a couple of principles, I would say, uh, around measurement? The first one is that if somebody says, here are the three metrics for any business, this is just wrong. The reason why it's wrong is because there is no such thing, because the types of impact that an organization is having on people, on its customers, even on the environment, varies quite a bit based on the points of intersection. 
So if you are having, for example, um, a carbon intensive business, of course, scope one carbon emissions might be very, very important. If you are actually in um, a technology company, data privacy issues, cyber security issues are extremely, extremely important. If you are a consumer's good company, uh, the type of products that you're selling and the ingredients in terms of whole grains versus sugar versus sodium and how they affect human health are the extremely, extremely important topics. So actually taking a step back, understanding how an organization is impacting employees, customers, the environment, local communities is the key first step. And that leads me to the second principle, which is strategy should lead measurement and reporting, not the other way around. And I think this is such a core component because we cannot have business that creates value independent of the impact. And then we're thinking about how to allocate that value that has been created. We need to have actually, I think, a business perspective where we say, how can we create value by having positive impact? And as you say, sometimes it's hard because it involves real trade-offs. Right? But I think that's where, from a management and governance perspective, it gets really interesting because you get to make actually really tough decisions. And at the end of the day, again, to go to the institutional level and to avoid the crisis that you mentioned also at the country level. I have had that crisis as well. I, was, I, I grew up in Athens, Greece. That was, for, for over the past decade, it has suffered tremendously, having lost almost... 25% of the GDP, seeing unemployment rates going from 10% to 30% and poverty level skyrocketing. And part of the issue is that when we don't see that value creation process fundamentally as an engine of social prosperity and social progress. So the, going back to the metrics, so the, the second element also relates to that core idea where we are actually going through strategy and defining actually the metrics in order to allow you to have better decisions. The third element that I would like to mention is that we cannot be concentrating on what I call input into the process. We need to concentrate on the actual outcomes and impacts. What do I mean about, uh, with that, Alvaro? What I mean is that actually, if you look at what most companies are doing, and what you will find mostly in sustainability reports with great exceptions, but traditionally that's how, how it has been, is that you will find lots of things around policies and principles and efforts and even uh, investments and so forth, much less actually about the outcomes and the impact. So think about an issue such as, for example, an enormous issue of creating jobs and creating human capital inside the organization. So uh, the first thing that we tend to measure actually is what? Train, number of people that have been trained, number of uh, training hours, number of dollars invested in training, and so forth, right? Because it's also easier. Measuring inputs is easier, right? This is what we're putting into the process. But actually what really works is when you measure outcomes, meaning that what happens to that person that goes through the training program? Is that person actually more capable at performing the jobs? Is that person somebody that will actually see increased wages in the future? Is that person somebody that will be able to actually have more longevity inside the organization because it's, it's more successful now? So have we enabled that? And in another really interesting study, Alvaro, we actually documented this super interesting effect where we, when we looked at actually input metrics, for example, dollars, for example, spend on training, actual money spent on training, and we looked at the correlation with future employee productivity, that correlation was zero. There was no correlation. They were completely uncorrelated. But when we looked at an outcome metric, meaning about how these people that went through the training their wages increased over time and whether the organization was able to keep them in the organization and retain that talent, we found a very strong relationship to employee productivity. So I want to also highlight that moving towards the measurement of actual outcomes and impacts 
rather than just inputs. Excellent, excellent, great points. And and you mentioned something about uh, employees. Uh, today, what we see is that uh, the hiring process and the retention process in companies, uh, it's becoming much more challenging if you uh, do not commit as a company to this sustainability component, right? The strategy behind or has to have a, a sustainability approach as well, because people will no longer want to work with you uh, if you don't commit with what they think they believe in. And the same may happen with, with um, consumers, customers, clients, right? They want companies that uh, have a, a, a purpose, for instance, and, 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 and let me uh, ask you uh, precisely um, about, about purpose. Um, what, what is the impact of having a purpose that presents the generation of financial benefits on the performance of a company, on the productivity of commi and commitment uh, of, of its employees? What would you say uh, to business leaders seeking to promote sustainability about purpose? How relevant is it to be sustainable? It's, it's so close to, to my heart, this discussion, Alvaro, working on, the, on this idea of purpose now for a number of years. And let me start by saying, when I started working on this idea, I was listening to corporate purpose. And I was like, what does that even mean? Like, it sounds so soft, so vague. I just don't understand it. So what we have been trying to do is to try to make that concept harder, define it, measure it, and then understand its consequences, right? And what is happening inside organizations. So here are a couple of things that we have found. So the first thing on the definition. So corporate purpose is actually, the way that we define it is the extent to which the organization is delivering some meaning and value in society that extends beyond quantitative measures of financial performance. Now that definition allows you for credit corp to have a very different purpose compared to uh, any other company because you're unique. You're trying to do something unique because your competitive positioning is unique. Your products are trying to do something different for your clients and you are trying to have a different culture to attract the best talent. So what we have found is that that idea of corporate purpose gets expressed in different ways across companies. You might find that companies are there to empower people to actually use digital technology and through that get access to a globalized world. You find companies that have a purpose of actually improving human health fundamentally. And then you have actually companies that are, uh, that are there and their purpose is to provide financial security, right? As insurance companies might, might be there for that, right? So that purpose gets expressed. Now, the question is, um, how does this become real inside the organization? And it's not something that a senior leader can proclaim in a town hall and then every employee basically cynical about it or says, well, that is something that, you know, my boss is saying, but we don't really do that, right? Um, so what we have found in the data as well is that actually in many organizations, what you find is that there seems to be a decline in that sense of a purpose-driven business when you ask senior leaders, and go down to middle managers and go down to entry level employees and so forth. So the further down you go into organizations, people feel that our organization is not very much purpose driven. The second thing that we have found is that there are organizations that are able to flatten that curve up, where actually everybody in the side organization feel a very strong sense of uh, purpose and meaning at the work and what the organization is doing. When that happens, when actually there is a very strong sense of clarity from the management to the, all the employees about what is the organization doing, but not only what the organization is doing, but how are we doing it and how 
you, Alvaro, and me can contribute towards that, right? So what are the resources that we have? So me, at any function, from actually marketing to operations, to human resources, to client facing, I can actually be part of that purpose, right? And that's where we have found that you start flattening it out. And then the relationship to performance that we have found is that you actually need to have all these pieces. If you are not able to diffuse that sense of purpose from senior management, for example, to middle management, there is absolutely no effect on performance. So it's about purpose. It's about true clarity that's coming from senior management, empowering people inside the organization. And it's also about the diffusion of purpose inside the organization in order for an organization then to see performance benefits and real actually outcomes in terms of how the organization is operating. Yes, um, totally agree. I, I think it's a major challenge. Well, the, the more layers you have in the organization, the more difficult it is to to convey that sense of purpose and, and, and to the, the real meaning of that purpose into the day-to-day -day activities of the people. So you may have a, that very well embedded into the board and senior management level, but then how you make that happen and, and, and uh, convey that, that message to everyone. That's, and that's where you make uh, the real change, right? When everyone in the company is, is truly related to the purpose that the company has. Uh, we have an additional... But Sorry. because that's how also, to your point, Alvaro, because you're mentioning something that I think it's, it's extremely, extremely important, which is this idea of trust. And how do you build trust inside the organization? And this is something that we have found as well, because if you don't have trust, a high trust organization, then it's very hard actually to decentralize any activities. And then if you don't decentralize and give decision rights to people, then how can you expect them to be empowered and find their job meaningful and that they can have impact, right? So all of those concepts are actually interconnected and they flow from each other. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, in the case of, of Credit Corp, just a, as a, an, ad an additional layer of complexity, uh, we, we're a holding company that has a purpose, like an umbrella purpose, but then we have different businesses, right? In banking, micro lending, uh, insurance, uh, pension funds, and, and each one has its own purpose. So, but people need to make it more tangible and related to what we are uh, in order to be more committed to, to the purpose. So it's, it's a balance between having a, a, like a big purpose, but then more specific purposes for, for different businesses, uh, in our case, at least. Let me ask you uh, one question about value of companies. Because sometimes people think that investing and dedicating too much effort into sustainability initiatives may uh, make certain companies to lose value over time. And I, I know very well that you have done a lot of research on that. Can you make a comment on this? The comment that I would like to make related to that, Alvaro, is that the world is changing. And this is what we have found in our research as well. So if you were going back in the data 15 years ago or so, 20 years ago, what we would find is that in general companies that had better ESG performance on those material dimensions, right? Because materiality is also a very, very important idea about what is really important, strategically important for an organization differs, for example, across industries. If you're an insurance company or a pension provider or a bank, that is fundamentally very, very different from being a hotel operator. So what we have found was that companies are actually making those investments and they were improving their performance on ESG dimensions, actually were trading at a discount relative to competitors. So in general, investors viewed those companies as being, you could say, wasteful in terms of their resource allocation. And what we have shown is that in the last 15 years or so, that has, that has played. And now it is those companies that are able to improve their performance on material, environmental, social and governance dimensions that actually the successful implementation of that strategy leads them to trade at a premium. And the reason why they trade at a premium, for me, it's very intuitive because the way that I conceptualize those investments is 
basically as intangible assets. Going back to this idea of those capitals. So as you're improving performance, you're actually improving your brand, your reputation, your relationship with your customers, the ability to attract, going back to your point, great human capital and great talent inside the organization. We live in, a, in an economy that is not driven by nuts and bolts and machines anymore, right? It's driven actually by the power of ideas and by the trust that an organization has with the surrounding society. Um, so for me, it's very natural that we see this evolution also because fundamentally, increasingly, we're living also in a more and more transparent society. We're having actually the ability now to observe real behavior that 30 years ago, there would be no way um, that somebody would know what is happening in the other part of the world. So today, I'm sitting with you here, for example, I'm, I'm, back, in, I'm back in Greece, I travel from Boston, I'm here in Athens, and probably on social media, I can find what's happening in Peru, probably in the next minute. That was unimaginable, even actually 15 years ago. Um, so all of those ingredients, the, the change in values among young people, where they want to work, where they, what they want to consume, um, the increasing transparency and the increasing realization and shift of an economy from tangible assets to intangible assets, I think has led with a very, very different investment understanding in terms of what is the value of those ESG investments. Great points. Excellent. Thank you. And, and, and you know, that's, that's all, always a challenge for, 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 for some companies. And, and again, going back to the board and shareholders to, to convey this, this, uh, this component of, of value, long-term value. If you do the right thing, society will support you. And that has a lot of value, right? So that, that's critical. That, that vertex circle is, is critical to, to, to perform. Um, George, I, I would want to switch to a question that we got from the audience. Um, let me um, read it for you. Um, social and political polarization, as well as lack of trust in institutions, particularly in the, pro in the private sector, has become more common in several countries in the world. We're talking about polarization here. From your perspective, what may have caused this? What has the private sector done wrong and what should be done differently in order to regain trust and connect better with societal interests? Great, great question. It, it is a great, great question. It's also uh, an extremely difficult one because it's such a complicated topic uh, with so many forces that are operating at the same time. But let me try and give an answer, Alvaro, a um, humble answer, uh, and try to decompose it a little bit about what I think is happening over the years. I think part of the challenge is that a uh, large part of the population, both in developed, uh, in developed markets, but also in emerging markets, have seen uh, that they have been left behind, basically. They have seen uh, quite a bit of, uh, for example, nominal GDP growth. But then when you ask them and say, how has your life improved? How has your working life improved? Have you uh, achieved your aspirations? Is your health better? Um, is your family more secure and so forth? Um, for, there is a large part of the population that the answer would be no. In the last have you seen, years. have you, do you have, um some examples of countries where you've seen this and, and people asking you about this? Definitely, um, in, in the developed markets, even when you see, for example, in, in the United States, right? So where I'm based um, out in Boston, you see basically this almost like split of the country where you look at the last, in the data, the last 20, 30 years and so forth, and you actually find a large part of the population that hasn't really experienced real wage growth, for example, after you adjust for inflation, right? And then you have a, a large part of the population that has experienced enormous actually growth. And then when you go systematically, even uh, in many of the European countries, for example, 
but I know that the same thing is happening also in large part of Latin America as well, with increasing inequality over time, that actually a large part of the population feels that we're not participating in the fruits of productivity and innovation and global growth, globalization, and the building of global supply chains. At the same time, we have seen that actually countries also, for example, in Southeast Asia and so forth, enormous parts of the population have been lifted by poverty at the same time. So I want to think about it, right? So the, the, the changes that we're observing in inequality within countries is even after we see enormous actually alleviation of poverty over the last few decades, right? And I think what is happening is that when a large part of the population feels that actually we're, we're working hard, we're creating a tremendous growth, but we're not participating in that because we have been lacking access to the skills, the education, a lot of what we have been talking about before, the healthcare, uh, many of those dimensions. And as a result, we're not part of actually the critical supply chains. We cannot actually have access to opportunity, true access to opportunity and find jobs. They get disenfranchised because they understand that actually we're not on the same boat. There are two diverging boats that are going on and we're going on a different direction. And the natural instinct that people have and this has been my experience as well. I observed that in Greece, that um, as I mentioned before, went through a tremendous crisis. And in the middle of uh, the previous decade, it was actually close um, to getting out of the European Union because of that. Um, with the increasing polarization of the country internally um, and actually how the voting population went to the far right and the far left. And this is, this is the usual response that happens. And the reason for that is because when something is not working and when something is not working for you for a long time, you want to just flip the table. You don't want just to change the table, the, the table a little bit. You just want to flip it and say, well, it's not working either way. Why, why even try to mess around with it a little bit, right? So you're just trying to change the whole thing. And you say, let me try something that probably I would have never tried. Of course, what we know is that the track record of that is not very good for, for the people, actually, and for, for the prosperity of the countries, right? So, so, but I think this is a little bit of what's happening. And I think the role that business leadership has is actually creating a more inclusive growth environment. And in order to create a more inclusive growth environment, we need to actually think hard, not only about from a financial perspective, the actions that we take, but actually also from an impact perspective, an impact on customers, an impact on employees, and an impact on our natural environment. You leave us with, with this very, very uh, exciting and thoughtful uh, a comment, uh, George. Well, uh, I think we're, we're close to the end. So uh, I just want to thank you again. Great to see you again. Hope to see you soon. And, and thank you very much for, for being with, with us today. Thank it's you. It's my great pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Alvaro.